All right, well, let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get started. Or maybe a minute or two before the, the clock. I'm, I know that that's supposed to be an atomic clock and we're right on time, but I'm never, I'm never completely sure. Lord, we thank you for uh, this last day of the calendar year, and we pray that you would bless our time together. We think of your faithfulness uh, before this day and your faithfulness into the new year. We thank you that we, that we serve and love and are in relationship with the God that is outside of time. You're the Alpha and the Omega, and so there's nothing that has passed, is going to pass today, or is coming down the road that uh, is going to surprise you, uh, is going to astonish you or amaze you, because um, you're already there. And we thank you for the assurance that that gives us in our faith, that, that no matter what comes, you are with us. And we pray all these things in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 All right, so today um, we're going to take a little bit of a, a different look or, or we'll kind of build on what Pastor Jim did in the service. I will not be reading to you any dad jokes, so uh, oh, that, that, uh, find that as a, as a, as a relief, um, then well enough, uh, if, if you're disappointed, then, then you can. I'm sure if you found Jim, he'd tell you a few more. Um, well, we will be using Psalm 8, 1 through 4. You know, uh, my style is, that, uh, uh, is to make sure that this is a Bible study first and foremost, and then we will look at some of the evidences. Again, I mean, if Jim is, if Jim is not a scientist or a physicist, then um, I'm even more not a scientist or a physicist. What I am is, what I am is a thinker. Um, what I am is an observer. And I, I like to think that I come at things logically. And I think that the best, the best scientists approach their subject objectively. And so um, that may be more where I think my, my strength lies is that um, I'm not afraid to ask questions both of my faith and of science. And I think when we are honest in doing so, that gives us the opportunity to make uh, make connections for folks that, that maybe haven't thought that deeply about things. Because if you haven't noticed, we live in a culture that doesn't have a lot of deep thinkers. Uh, we're, we're, looking for, we're looking for shortcuts, and we're looking for people to, to tell us what to think, and what to say, and how to act. Um, and, and more than once, I have disappointed people in my congregations that come to me saying, well, just tell me the right answer. Um, because I think, I think therein lies the, the pathway to um, all sorts of error, is, is when you are depending on an individual to, to give you the answer, rather than being given the tools to do your own investigation, spend your own time in prayer, your own time in the Word, um, your own time in the fellowship of of believers to discern together. Uh, and the advantage of that, of course, is that when you do so, then your faith is your own. And your your convictions and your beliefs yeah. are your own. As opposed to, I read it in a book, or my preacher once said, those sorts of things can be knocked down pretty quickly. Um, and, and as somebody that, has, that was involved in youth ministry for youth, that are now of the generation that is, we, we're talking about how historically they are walking away from their faith and declaring themselves none of the above and all that sort of thing. Um, I consider it some, with some measure of pride that a lot of the kids that went through my programs are still very solid in their faith. It may have evolved, it may have changed, um, but, but they still have a relationship with God and, and it wasn't dependent on well, Pastor Chris told me this, and it's, I trust him. But it, it was something that they were led to believe of their own accord. So let's take a look at Psalm 8, uh, the first four verses again. I'll be reading from the New International Version. I'm not exactly sure what you have in your, in your notes because I've kind of bounced around between 
between versions, so if it's not exactly what you have on your page, I, I apologize. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise. Because of your enemies, you silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? Well, um, if we're looking at the scientific evidence for God's existence, again, so this is, I'm not, I'm, I'm speaking more of like scientific process and the difficulty of that when you are talking about something as big as the subject of God is that, is that, you know, science depends on being able to test the theory and repeat it. You know, somebody can take your experiment and replicate it in their lab and they get something close to the same results. And so, to some degree, this is uh, this is a misuse of some of the language that comes around science and scientific discovery. But again, um, I say that with the caveat of, of observation. We can all do observation, and I think that that uh, the best the best thinking comes out of just thinking carefully about our world and what we see and what we interact. So uh, I've got a couple of points that I've got down there, and you can fill in the blanks or add your own notes, and I would like this to be as interactive as possible as well. So uh, the first evidence that is given by the psalmist here that could be somewhat categorized as, as scientific would be uh, the majestic creation. So Psalm 8, verses 1 and 2, starts out by acknowledging the majesty of God's name and his glory above the heavens. And that this sets the stage for understanding the magnificence of God's creation. I think, I think any time we approach a subject like this, it's best to do so from humility. And those, um, I, I, I don't understand either preachers or scientists that I interact with, either one, when they don't have a whole lot of humility, when they're not, uh, when they're not scared to say, I don't know, or let me get back to you on that, or perhaps that's something we could study together or read about together. Um, the people I think we should be afraid of are those that are so assured of their position that they do not entertain conversation or an opposing viewpoint. That That's a very dangerous place to, um, to find oneself in because more often than not, what you find yourself doing is, as more and more is discovered, um, as you do your own thinking and investigation, you're, you kind of proverbially paint yourself into the corner. And then you're not left with a whole lot of options if there's evidence to the contrary. Of whatever, whatever dogmatic. the dogmatic thinking of this, you know, I'm going to stand on this point. Now, that's where a lot of my, just my general discipleship and leadership in the church comes from is that um, my convictions about things that the Bible teaches pertain the ones that I will not be pushed off of or shoved off of where I have painted myself into the corner if you want to use that illustration again almost solely to do with what I believe is the central purpose of the Bible which is to lead people to salvation and to give a testimony to who Jesus is um, any other point, you know, the number of cubits, you know, and this passage versus that passage, and how big was the tabernacle, and does this contradict this over here? Okay, like that may be, may or may not be the case, but that's not something that, that I'm going to fight tooth and nail uh, to defend, um, <laughs> because I think that when we get to heaven, we can ask. We can ask him ourselves, and then he'll sort it out for us. Uh, so humility. I think humility is a, is a great place to start. And that's, that's basically what the psalmist is doing. Looking up at the sky, looking at God's creation, and just going, whoa. Yeah. You know, like, so, someone or something is responsible for all of this. You know, even if you don't want to approach it from a... A relationship with with God our Father 
you know, to just look. If somebody is honest and, and you, you take them outside and look at the stars, go someplace where there's not a whole lot of light pollution, and just look up, you just realize the immensity of creation. And then you think about, as the psalmist does later, how infinitesimally small we are, we are in comparison so to that. And then you think about, you know, this this gray matter that we've got between our ears that is that is this miraculous computer in, in and of itself to make sense of our senses and our world. And, and we're filtering all of this through all of this. And if that doesn't give you a little pause to say, whatever I'm about to speak about now, whatever I'm about to postulate, whatever I'm about to say, this is true and this is false, then I think you're just not being particularly honest with yourself. And the truth that we have as Christians is truth that has been revealed to us, which means that there was some of it that may have been self-evident. You know, like we talked about the, the founding of our nation as, as, as Christian. More they were deists of a Christian tradition because they believed in, um, they believed in a maker. They believed in a creator. But some of them you could not push so far as to say they had a personal relationship with God. Um, but they believed that, that there were some self-evident truths. That if you just looked at creation, if you just looked at the way things were ordered, then you could make certain assumptions based on that. That is not enough to get you to biblical faith in Jesus Christ. Because... God had to reveal himself to us in Jesus. That's, that's the main thing that sets Christianity apart from other philosophies or, or religious traditions, which were, were kind of created as a, as a way of making <laughs> sense of our world and, and a deity that's out there, you know, reaching up, whereas Christianity is God reaching down to us in Jesus Christ. So, um, Jim mentioned, you know, evidence such as the Big Bang and um, Edwin Hubble, Hubble and, it, and his proof that the universe is expanding and that, again, there's, there is a, all sort of theories are, are extrapolations of observed evidence, right? So we can observe that the universe is expanding and then say, well, then it's continuing to expand, or maybe not. Maybe it's maybe now it's contracting. No, the evidence is that it continues to expand at a higher and higher rate. Yeah, which so means some, which means something's happening in addition to the Big Bang. The Big Bang, you can understand that, right? Yeah, I mean, everything right. hits, but what's, what's causing, causing it what to accelerate? Like there's, there's, yeah, what's causing it? That, that requires a force of some sort. So it, it's remarkable what's going on, and we have no idea what's going on. Yeah. So. Does it mean we're headed for trouble? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not. I'm headed for heaven. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it's fascinating to think at the speed at which it's expanding. No, no, that it's, to even like well, and, yeah. and to to blow your mind, like what's what is it expanding into? That's exactly. What's beyond space? A lot of mysteries. Yes. So. So extrapolating that back to well, it all it all originated from a singularity or from a from a point. Um, these are fascinating things to ponder. But again, I think from a position. They'll give you a headache. If yes, they'll give you a headache. <laughs> but but that's isn't that isn't that the I would I would think that that would be a place then to lean into humility of humility. saying there's there's some there's some areas that we have that we that we understand. And that there's evidence for and there's things that we just simply cannot explain. Um, the, uh, those, those verses that are at the beginning of our, our Bible, I remember, I don't remember a whole lot of Hebrew, to be quite honest. I had to take it in seminary, and I survived it. We wouldn't understand. But those, uh, those words, formless and void, I remember those because they rhyme. Tohu babohu. All right? So now you know as much Hebrew as I know. Tohu babohu. It's formless and and void, and that the um, 
the, the poetic description that we get in the first couple of chapters of, of God uh, creating something out of nothing, ex nihil, uh, in the Latin, is that idea that, that there is someone or something outside of the, the mess or the chaos that then gives it order. That, that that is that that is the process of of creation, and I think that's a a, a great point of connection when you're just <laughs> trying to talk to somebody about your faith and scientific evidence. I mean, what do we see? What can we observe? Um, I don't know too many people, if any, maybe one. I worked with one person in Christian camping that said that said they were, they were convinced into the faith through scientific evidence. That's the only person I've ever run into. Um, and I've run into a lot of people <laughs> in my lines of work that have, that have questions. I think more often than not, uh, we do best when we don't try to argue someone into the faith, but that we, we welcome their questions. And we ask questions of our own. And we're just curious. And honestly curious. Not curious with the point of, I'm going to wait till you trip up or you say something dumb and then I'm going to point out how dumb you are. Yeah. That's not particularly helpful. Has anybody ever done that to you? No. Or you felt they were doing that to you? Yeah. Was they were asking you questions, but they weren't really sincere questions. They were making statements. They weren't asking questions. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and, and when we're talking about, you know, origin of the universe type of stuff and making sense of, of, the expanse of the universe or the minute details that we find within the cell or the atom. Oh, we're, we're, we're treading on, I mean, if you'll forgive me as a theologian, we're treading on holy ground. It's not, it's not something we didn't, we didn't make it. We didn't create it. We're just observing it. Right? Yeah. And, and so, um, it, it, if we can, if we can show that individual that has honest questions, that we too have some questions, um, but that there are some things that we we've, we've arrived at with some level of assurance, because you know, in a sense, because they worked for us. You know, if you want to get pragmatic, <laughs> you say this is this is something. When push comes to shove, with a lot of folks, I've said, I said, you know what? One of the reasons that I'm a Christian is that I investigated all other options, and I really did, and I. I read the scriptures backwards and forwards as a young man, and and I kind of came to the conclusion, pragmatically, that, well, if I live my life according to these tenets, and patterned after Jesus Christ, at the very worst, I will have lived a, a meaningful life that bettered other people's situations. Amen. And I will die and become dirt. That's right. That's the worst that could happen. Okay. Which is still pretty darn good. Um, at best, obviously, I'm I'm right, and i've I've read the I've read the material presented to me correctly and made the right conclusions, and I get to spend eternity with God in heaven. Amen. It's a win-win. It's a win-win. Okay. So, um, and and that's what I mean by kind of approaching people with where they're at. With their questions is that is that as soon as as soon as a lot of folks that have these honest questions about the faith and how it pertains to science, um, maybe they grew up in the church, maybe they grew up in a tradition where they were not allowed to ask honest questions or admit some quandary or to point out that, um, like I think I've mentioned it here before. Uh, the error that's done to our testimony when we come in and say, you know, peace, peace, and anything in our life is anything but peace, you know, or cussing our kids out in the car before we came into church. Um, and then that when we live sort of with that level of hypocrisy, of putting on our game face when we come to, to church, but not really living it out honestly and authentically out there, people notice. And the flip is, the, 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 the converse is true as well. As soon as we start living authentically, yes. and, and we set ourselves apart, 
in that way, then people will notice and will be attracted to that. Because we live in a day and age where there is not a lot of authenticity. Everybody's selling us on something. And so people are really cautious about us selling them our religious system. So if we live into and live out our faith, then it becomes less and less that I'm trying to sell you on my belief system. It's more I'm, I'm letting you do the science on me. Just observe. You know, that, was, that was Jesus' approach, right? When they came, came at him and said, well, the Pharisees do it this way, the Sadducees do it this way, and you do it this way. And, and he, said, he said, basically, you know, how do you judge a tree? By its fruit, right? Mm -hmm. Stick around, check out the fruit. It's pretty much what he said. So if we can do the same, if we can emulate that same sort of faith, then that that puts us on the spot, doesn't it? <laughs> that puts us on the spot to have some fruit. And, and to, to work on ourselves before we're working on somebody else. So the first point is the, the majestic creation. Second point, the design of the universe. Um, that... I, I mentioned this to some degree, so I won't belabor it. Verse 3 speaks about the heavens, the moon, the stars, which God set into place. Now, scientifically, the vastness and precision of the cosmos point to an intricate design rather than a random chance. Um, the complexity and orderliness of the universe suggests intelligent design. I like that divine meant, design better. What's that? I like divine design better than intelligent Divine design, design. intelligent design. <laughs> Um, yeah, and, to, and maybe that's just because it, we've met a lot of people that are not particularly charismatic, that are intelligent. We like to think of our God as a relational, charismatic, endearing God. Um, yeah, and to Jim's point, you know, when we see the, you know, we got the big bang and then things started spinning. You know, who, who, you know, who gave it the flick that started spinning in the first place? That sort of thing. The uncaused cause. Isaac Newton wrote about if something was set into motion, someone or something set it into motion. Um, I, I think of it in terms of just what what makes sense. What makes sense to to you or I? What's, what's logical is that when you like Michael uh, collected a lot of Legos over the years. Okay. At a certain point, he wanted to move on from the Legos. So I like I'll buy your Legos from you and I'll. I'll reconstruct some of the sets and I'll sell them on eBay. Well, easier said than done, right? Because he had modified some things, changed some things. So even the, even the sets that were complete, and I knew amongst the tens of thousands of pieces that were laying before me, that all the pieces I needed to build things according to the design that I was given were there. I just had to find them and assemble them. Ha <laughs> Right? <laughs> okay? Um, so imagine walking to a room with, you know, hundreds of thousands of Legos spread out on the floor. <laughs> and in the middle of that pile, you see, you know, what's something we could build? A castle. A castle. Okay, we see a castle constructed in the middle of this pile of Legos. We would, we could make, we could make a couple assumptions, correct? One, somebody was in the room before we were right. to put all the Legos there. All the pieces. They didn't, they didn't spontaneously create themselves. <laughs> they came from somewhere. Um, and then, what distinguishes the castle from the rest of the pieces? Order. Order. Combination. Order. Combination. Completion. Completion. Design, design, some idea that they went together in a certain... But somebody to make it happen. Yes. And, and I think, um, you know, the point that occurs to me right now is that this <laughs> was put together in a design that would make sense to Someone the sensor, to, to, to me. Yeah. Right? So. You would identify that as a castle. You would know that that was structured by somebody. Relatedly, yeah. the word became flesh. The word the flesh. The concept, the design, and the labor preceded the completed structure. Right. And, and the thought of the, I mean, if we want to extrapolate this even 
further is that, you know, and we read in Ephesians that, that God chose us before the foundations of the world. Is that you've got, not only do you have an uncaused cause, but you've got a, you have a designer that, that uh, was able to think not only of the order of creation and to give it beauty, but to design us in such a way that we could appreciate that beauty. And that we could discern between a rotten piece of fruit and a good piece of fruit. Um, that that we have we would have the senses to be able to to discern there's something different about the assemblance of this castle versus the the chaos of a bazillion small little pieces. I find that sort of thing just fascinating. Because you can lead you can lead people through logical conclusions like that. We, we make those same sorts of assumptions all the time. We place our faith in, in people and things and processes every day. And we assume things are going to be a certain way or done a certain way. Um, but, you know, we drive down the road and the light turns red, and what do we assume? Stop. Everyone's we, stop. we assume that not only are, are we going to stop, but that everybody else is at least going to make the attempt to stop. If they are paying attention. So that's where our defensive driving might be. <laughs> so we're looking around to see who's texting on their phone, um, who's paying attention to their text. But, but we just sort of end that at a certain point. If you've been driving long enough, you don't think about those things anymore. You know, that, that there's enough of a pattern and an expectation. Um, so if we can observe that sort of design and that sort of logic in our lives, then um, maybe that's a way that we can start a conversation with somebody that has some some honest disagreements or quandaries or or they look at the same evidence that we're looking at and they don't draw the same conclusions. We can say, well, why, why is that? What is it? What have you observed here? Um, third point, the human significance. Okay, now this is the one that always cracked me up. When I was, uh, there was a time in my life that I read a lot more science fiction than I do now. Um, but in middle school and high school, I love to pick up a science fiction book. And it is always, you know, way out in the future. It always assumed that humans were still going to be out there. You know, or you watch Star Trek, right? And, all, you know, mysteriously, all the aliens they encountered, for the most part, there's the occasional, like, you know, rock blob or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but more often than not, the aliens look like somebody that Captain Kirk wanted to date. You know? yeah. so, <laughs> I'm like, hey, lucky for Kirk, you know, um, that, uh, that, that in the vastness of the, I thought, I thought, man, and, and it's really, it's one of the things that, that fascinates me about the, um, about the theory of evolution, that we arrive, I mean, I'm, I'm squishy and vulnerable, and yeah, I've got brains, and I can make tools, and I can provide for myself in other ways, but I thought, given billions of years, couldn't have something a little hardier than me have evolved? You well, know, I, I'm, I'm, I think since the world is covered with air, we should have got wings out of this. Something, we should have gotten, yeah, I don't know. You know, we didn't need fins and breathe underwater because that's only part of it. That's a whole other discussion. It I say, so I have respect. I have respect for the science fiction authors. I'll get back to my my original point. I have respect for the science fiction authors that kind of wrote humans out of the story. And, and presumed that something more suited to the future was going to survive. You know, like cockroaches. Um, or ants. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I don't know if that's the thought that the thomas, psalmist is having here. You know, he says, when I look at everything, what, what am I? What is a human being that you're mindful of me? You know, I, and, and, Beyond that, I mean, this psalmist is writing before the incarnation of Christ, right? Yeah. How much more? Wouldn't that be a fascinating? That's a fascinating thought experiment. Experiment is take um, take David, who we believe to be the author of this psalm. I mean, it's credited to him, so that means he either wrote it or had somebody write it for him. You know, put him in a time machine and say, "Here's your great, 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 great grandson." You know, and he's the and he's God. I mean, <laughs> right, right, right. After he's having these sorts of thoughts, like, what is, what are we that you're mindful of us, God? And that's part of 
um, when you think about the other monotheistic religions, Judaism um, and, and Islam, that their, their big objection to Christianity is that something big enough to do this could be encased in this. Except, oh, yeah. except God created us in his image, therefore it's logical that he would be mindful of us. To, in, a, in a sense, in the back of my brain is saying. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. Because we're created in his image. That is the significant part of the, the creation of Lord High. He, yeah. he chose to breathe the breath of life. We, 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 you know, he didn't do that to, to the dogs and the camels and the grass or anything else. It was us. Right. So that makes us significantly important to him. He said so from the first breath into the first breath. As soon as he created so that's the next point, appreciation of God's handiwork. And that's, that's us. You jumped the gun. As, yeah. The psalmist marvels at God's creation, emphasizing the insignificance of humanity compared to the vastness of the universe. So it's not, it's not a matter of, uh, of likeness as much as it is magnitude. Because you're right, we are created in, in God's image and likeness. But um, we're awful tiny compared to the immensity of God's creation. Yeah. And this calls for awe and gratitude for God's immense power and wisdom to display in creation. Um, and acknowledging God's mindfulness, and that's and the next point, despite our smallness in comparison to the universe, the, the psalmist recognizes that God is mindful of humanity. And we can reflect on the scientific evidence that shows Earth's unique conditions. This is the precise tuning piece. Right? That if the that, that if the Earth's axis were were off just a little bit, or if it didn't wobble just a bit, or if we didn't, you know, if we didn't experience the seasons, we didn't, if on its tilt, rotating around the sun once a year, we didn't, ex you know, there are places, there are places in, you know, you can go to Arizona where it may feel like it's summer all the time, but it's not literally summer all the time. You know, it's experiencing warming and cooling patterns. And, and the and the moon being set just where it is so that it causes you know weather patterns and, and the tides, tides and, and, and I mean it's just there's um, so those I don't know if specifically those constants that that Pastor Jim was speaking of are on a much smaller scale than that or if he was talking about some of these evidences that I'm um, I'm referring to um, but the idea that that you know, if you had all of these things and they were just set to dials, just right at the precise thing, and then, you know, you bumped one with your elbow, you know, and it throw the whole thing out of whack. Um, to me, not only is that fascinating, but, but that, the, that the more we delve into this, the chances are there are going to be more and more of these factors that we realize how finely things are tuned for life on this planet. And... It should give us pause for having the arrogance to say, you know, well, it doesn't really matter how we treat the earth because Jesus is coming back. Or it doesn't really matter how we do this, that, or the other. I've read the end of the story, and, and, and Jesus is coming back, and this is the way it's going to happen. It's like, well, okay. <laughs> but when you, it's just like when, you, when somebody gives you a gift that's handmade, or, or someone has baked you something and you realize the time they put into it, that should change the way you you appreciate it, right? It's not just, I didn't go to this convenience store and buy you a ding dong. You know, I, 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 I baked you a cake. You go, oh, I realized there was design and effort and thought and intent in this. So if we realize that, that okay, not only is there a designer, but that designer wants to relate to me and has created the conditions in such a way that's so precise and so finely tuned that, that I could live life on this orb. Now, now how, I, how I ought to treat this gift that I've been given? And what should my attitude towards that gift be? Certainly not, you know, I think, certainly not, I don't care, whatever. Doesn't matter. If you um, do that, you're not caring for other people and, and 
this causes us to love one another. So yeah. you, 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 you can't. Yeah. If you're a Christian, it, it just is not a thing that you want. Right. Like if you just took all that time to bake me a cake and I, I was like, oh, thanks, and I dumped it in the garbage. Yeah. Lots of right. That, <laughs> I mean, we know enough to know that's rude. <laughs> and I'm probably not going to get another cake. That's right. All right. So all of us that are all of us that are hoping for a new heaven and a new earth, that doesn't mean trash the, the, yeah. the first one. It means wait expectantly for the new heaven and new earth and take as good a care of the one that we've got while we've got. Uh, the last two points. That, so these things, these observations lead to contemplation and worship. So um, the nice thing about truth and Jesus saying I'm the way, the truth, and the life is that if something is true it will point to God it will point to Jesus if something is not true, it won't point to Jesus ultimately so there's, if, if somebody comes to me with something and, and it claims to be truth, we can investigate it together and if it is in fact, if it is in fact truth it will point to me to God. I don't have to fear that somebody's coming to me with, with true information about the universe and that, that is somehow going to make my faith collapse. Because if we believe what we believe about Jesus, that he knew he was God's son, and he was teaching on behalf of God the Father, and he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, okay, the, the creator, and that scripture testifies that there is nothing that was made that wasn't made through Jesus, and then he made the claim, I am the truth, big T truth. Do you think Jesus is up there in heaven someplace going, oh, I hope they don't discover this scientific principle. <laughs> <laughs> I hope they don't ask questions about this. I hope they don't see what's on that distant star up there somewhere. I mean, if we, you know, if we really believe what we say we believe about Jesus, then we don't have to fear any of that. Nothing can surprise him. Nothing can surprise him. And he made the claims that he made. If, if, we, if we really believe, Jesus is who he said, he made the claims that he made with full knowledge of all the things that we would discover before he came back. Yeah. Now, the scripture also tells us that there's a day coming when the hearts of men will grow cold, that people will gather up, you know, teachers will gather up, listeners to themselves and, and they'll say the things that tickle the ears and 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 that that people will start to doubt and to question uh, so i'm not speaking about all those things i'm thinking about i'm speaking about those who are honestly seeking truth that are about an investigation into what is true and how can we make sense of all of this which is why i think more and more the, the scientists that are out there doing some of this work they may not be born again Christians, but they're at least saying, "Yeah, there's a preponderance of evidence that would lead me to believe there is." You didn't want me to use intelligent. What was the word? Divine design. A divine design. A divine design. Okay. Intelligence. Just okay. which, just I mean, if you're looking, looking at the language, they're just saying something outside of ourselves, yeah. right? <clears throat> um, that that gave it purpose. And then last of this last point, engaging others, using the scientific evidence of the, of the universe design and unique conditions for life on Earth is a way to engage in conversation about God's existence. Again, I don't, I don't think these are the things that are going to convince anybody to the faith. Um, but I, I feel strongly enough about our faith that if somebody starts to really question and ponder, there is enough evidence that would lead somebody to say, yeah, I'll consider your Jesus, or at least we could talk about it. Um, and then God does the rest. We believe that, don't we? Yes. Yes. That that, that, that we testify, and, and that testimony is, that's like the seed that's, that's placed in the soil. And then from that point on, we don't got a whole lot to do with it. No. Nope. <laughs> you know, we, we, we can cultivate the soil. We can, we can try to create the conditions that are going to be 
that the people with honest questions can, can come to us or come to our our meeting places, our places of worship and of faith, and, and ask those questions, and then and then the Holy Spirit works on the individual's heart. And that's not that's that's not the, to say that we abdicate our responsibility to give no. to give a testimony because where it says you know um, be be a workman that that could be approved you know that be be prepared to give a reason for the hope that's within you you know those those sorts of scriptures to say say and it's not so much about memorizing certain scriptures having a certain apologetics plan, you know, if somebody comes up with this argument, I'll be prepared with this argument. I want to go back to where I started with the authenticity and the humility to allow people the space to ask questions and to say, yeah, that's a really good point. Let's look into that together. Or, or um, would you, you know, that's an interesting point I have to consider. Would you, is there a book that you would recommend that I read to investigate that? If you're willing to actually do it, again back to the authenticity piece. And if they say, "Well, yeah," and they hand you a book and you repeat it or you read it, you read it and come back to them and say, "Well, this this is really fascinating. I found these particular points." And then they see that you've invested into their line of inquiry, and then you say, "I've got a book maybe that you might like to read," and then you've then you've made the relational deposit that might give them pause before they just dismiss your ideas. They might still dismiss your ideas. They might say, no, I'm good. But then at least you've done as much as, as you could to build the bridge, right? You build the bridge halfway, and they got to build the other half of the bridge That's right. for that connection. And, and you've shown that you're willing to invest. And I would say more often than not, if, if God is in that relationship and is working, that, that then maybe you make the offer and they say, okay, sure. Put the seeds there. Yeah, you put, you, you put the seed there. Yeah. So, all right, let's close in prayer and we'll have some time for discussion around the table and we'll conclude uh, taking Lord's Supper. God, I thank you for the chance to ponder these things. Um, obviously, this is not a scientific classroom. Uh, far from it. There probably, probably some things that, that I said would, wouldn't be exactly scientifically true. And um, I apologize to you, uh, great designer, for that and to those in the room. But I thank you that we can all be thinkers and we can approach your creation with humility can approach one another with humility. We can observe both what's in our hearts and what we see with our senses, what we experience. And we pray that it would draw us closer to you. Be in our conversation now. Lord, help us to be respectful of one another because uh, wherever two or three are gathered, there's bound to be an argument if we let there be one. Um, but also, you are in our and, um, and we want to be respectful of your presence in this room as well by the way that we treat um, our brothers and sisters. So uh, be with us in this time. In Jesus' name, amen.